Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday Thought, I want to talk to you guys. I feel impressed by the Spirit to talk to you guys about what it means to be a king and a queen or a priest and a priestess. I, I got up this morning, and all week I've known what I wanted to talk about on Thursday. And when I woke up, I just felt really impressed that, that this is what I should talk about. And I want to start off by reading a couple of scriptures. The first one is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. This is God speaking about Israel to Moses. He says, And ye, Israel, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The second scripture I want to look at with you real quick is Revelations 5.10. There's a song being sung here. I'm going to paraphrase it. But basically, in verse 10 of the song, in verse 10 of the chapter, in this part of the song, they're singing, and you, God, have made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. And then lastly, I, I want to skip over to the plates of brass. And this is chapter, I'm sorry, this is 4th Moses, chapter 8, verse 25. And thou shalt remember that Israel is a holy people, a nation of kings and queens, of priests and priestesses. Now, I read it in this order. Technically, if you want to look at this from a historical timeline, you'd say that Exodus probably came first. Fourth Moses probably came second. And then Revelation, obviously, would have come last in, in, in these scriptures. And I read them in this order because there's a progression here. It starts off a kingdom of priests. And then in Revelation, kings and priests. And then the plates of brass, kings and queens, priests and priestesses. And I think, this is my own opinion here, but I believe that from the very beginning, from, from Exodus, it was always kings and queens, priests and priestesses. Now, whether biblical writers change that or if, it was just an understanding that, that we're supposed to just know that the kings also referred to queens and that the priests also referred to priestesses. I can't say. But because I believe in equality, I, I understand that when the Lord speaks, we as human beings may misunderstand and think that you know if, if we are misogynists, we may think that God's only talking about men. But when the Lord speaks, he's obviously going to be speaking of the whole human race not merely just men and women. I mean, well, I should say not merely just men, and, and also because there are people who are non-binary, asexual, etc. He's also speaking to them as well. I don't think we have a term in our English language, though, that describes someone in, in royalty that is non-binary. So we have to use the English words we have, so we're going to say kings and queens, priests and priestesses. Now, I want to... I wanna, we looked at the religious side. I want to go over here and look at what do these words mean on, on a, a, a secular level. So I'm going to look here at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. A king is a male monarch of a major territorial unit. Um, someone that holds a preeminent position. A queen is, you know, can be the wife or widow of a king, or it can be a female monarch or chieftain, a woman of eminent rank, power, or attractions. And then let's look at priest and priestess. A priest is one who is authorized to perform sacred rites of a religion, especially as a mediary agent between humans and God. Mediatory agent, sorry. A priestess is a woman authorized to perform sacred rites of religion. So really, they both mean the same things, just one's male, one's female. We don't have a gender neutral term for these. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind when I read this is, I don't know, this is about the time that the Levites are being put together. So how is everybody in Israel a priest or a priestess? And there are no kings or queens. So how is anybody a king or a queen? I want to take the priest and priestess portion, and I want to set it to the side for a moment. 
if, if you don't mind. I, I want to first focus on the king and queen, because I think that if we if we don't understand this king and queen concept, we're not going to be able to understand the priest and priestess concept. In our world today, and I'm going to do everything I can to not get political here, so you don't have to worry about that, I hope. Our idea of being a king or a queen, in my mind, is somewhat warped. The idea is it's someone that sits on the throne and rules over other people. I, I generally think of that show or that book, a uh, series of books, I should say, Game of Thrones. You have people fighting because they want to be the one at the top of the chain. And I think that for a worldly perspective, that is a fair definition. But is Israel? I, I don't think that it's our definition. We need to look at at our king, and that's Jesus Christ. How did he live his life? Satan offered him as one of him as one of the great temptations. You know, I will give you all the things of this world. Here, you created this, but I'll give it to you. I always laugh when I read that. But Jesus said no. He was humble. He was a servant to the people. He went around healing the sick, raising the dead. And when he came into Jerusalem, if you pay attention to the way he did it, he went in in the opposite direction. And he did everything the opposite of what royalty of that time were known to do. He was, he was basically a satire or a mockery of the royalty of that time. So I don't think that we, as Israel, as kings and queens... Are, are meant to be rural, 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 rural rulers, I keep wanting to say rural, like <clears throat> farmland, rulers over other people. I think we're supposed to be servants to the people. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. Because I've talked to a lot of these things. One woman in particular comes to mind. This was many, many years ago. She was trying to tell me that, and, and, we both live here in the United States. She was trying to tell me that her land, the land that she owns, she and her husband are the kings and queens of that property. And that therefore it is their sovereign nation. And no one has any right to set foot on their sovereign nature, their their soil. And, you know, no government in the world has access to it. And, and so they shouldn't pay taxes and blah, blah, blah. And this is where I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to get political. But I do bring that up because what did Jesus say about taxes? Given to Caesar that which is Caesar's, right? It's his face on the coin. Give him his money back. I think that this idea that we're supposed to be a sovereign nation spits in the face of what God is trying to say here. No offense to this woman. Because if we're all kings and queens, then we're all supposed to be working, serving one another as Christ served us. We're not supposed to be carving out territories and building thrones. We're supposed to be loving one another and extending a hand and being willing to die for our friends, as Jesus said. Jesus said that there is no greater gift that we can give but to die for our friends. I'm obviously paraphrasing him there. So the first thing we have to understand in this idea of kings and queens and priests and priestesses is that God isn't calling us to be authoritarians, or to give us authority over others in any way, shape, or form. And I want to tell you right now that, I, well, before I tell you right now, I want to show you the scripture. Hang on. We're going to go to the Book of Mormon. And we're in Chapter 7, um, RAV, that's the Community of Christ, or RLDS tradition. And chapter 10 for the OPV, which is the Salt Lake City Church, uh, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Brighamite tradition. And I want to start off in 7.18 and 10.11. It says, This land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land who shall rise up unto the Gentiles. Now that sounds very much like what the Lord wanted for Israel when he was being formed. Because remember... God didn't want them to have a king, but they, they got jealous of their neighbors. And so eventually God said, okay, fine, you want a king, I'll give you a king. And, you know, what was it, three, four kings later, and 
Israel's divided into two different nations, and shortly after that, they're both conquered. So they coveted what their neighbor had, and then their neighbors came and took what they had. So there shall be no kings upon this land. And then if you go down a couple of verses, verse uh, 720 and then 7, I'm sorry, 720 and 1014. It, well, 720 and 21, I should say, which are both seven, which are both 1014. He that rises up a king against me shall perish. For I, the Lord God, the king of heaven, will be their king. And I will be a light unto them forever that hear my words. There's two things I want to talk about here. One is the idea of anyone that anyone that tries to raise up a king against God. Okay, that, that's problem number one. And then problem number two is, or issue number two, I don't know if this was necessarily a problem, that the Lord God, Jesus Christ, the King of Heaven, is going to be our King. Now, I don't think that any of the prophets at any time of the world were perfect, and I'm going to say something that I know is going to offend a lot of people. But I believe that one of the reasons why James Strang and Joseph Smith were murdered, why the Lord allowed that, was because they both anointed themselves king. They weren't meant to be a king. It says right here, again, 721, 1014b, I, the Lord, the king of heaven, will be their king. And I will be a light on them forever. They hear my words. I, I don't have any other king. I only have Jesus Christ as my king. And so had James Strang or Joseph Smith lived and continued this tradition of having a king prophet president, in my mind, that's very problematic because then I would have to serve two masters. The king that is Jesus Christ, my savior, and this other king, this, this, other, this other man who's declaring himself king, and so to stop that confusion, I do believe that the Lord intervened and allowed these two prophets to be slain. So they were both slain for their testimony. And they were also slain because they weren't leading people in the right direction. And yes, I know, as a Latter-day Saint, that's a very divisive thing to say. And if that offends you, I am sorry. I do not believe in, the, in, in people or prophets being perfect. And I say that as a prophet myself, I will tell you, I am not perfect. I'm striving, but I'm not perfect. So before we can move on into priests and priestesses, I want to make sure that you understand when the scriptures say that we Israel are supposed to be kings and queens, I believe that means we're supposed to serve one another. I believe that a king and a queen are the lowest branch, if you will. Because you may have someone that takes care of the horses, or you may have someone that, that takes care of the food, or someone that, that serves these people, or serves those people, or takes care of the children. The king and queen are below all of that because they serve the entire nation. So for us to be Israel, every single one of us must learn to serve the entire nation. I think that's what God is saying here. That is both a spiritual and a worldly perspective, which is what takes me to the second part, being priests and priestesses. Now, again, what's a priest and priestess? It's someone, some people would say it's someone who stands between us and God. Others would say it's someone who helps unite us to God. So if you have these Levites, and I, I genuinely believe exactly what it says in the plates of brass, that the sisters were called as priestesses, and the men were called as priests, and they had their duties. They had the things they had to do to serve Israel in a religious way, and doing these rites, and doing these various ordinances. So then how is all of Israel a priest and a priestess. Well, this is why I wanted to go over kings first. Because 
in a, in a worldly sense. A priest is someone who says, you stop there. You can talk to God, but I'm the one that listens. I'm the one that tells you what the Lord is saying. And as Israel, we, we can't be that kind of people. Sure, you can have people that are assigned to do certain rituals. But to be Israel, to be on that straight path back to God as a nation, as a people, as Latter-day Saints today, we have to be that person that talks to God directly ourselves and that helps our neighbors build that same connection. It's not really a whole lot more to get into than that. At this point, the veil has been rent, and we can all do the rituals. We can all participate in the ordinances. We can all be called to hold the priesthood, whether it be the low priesthood or the high priesthood. But our duty is still the same, to serve one another in a worldly temporal way and also in a spiritual way. When we sit and we just crack open the books and we learn and we learn and we learn and we learn, that's, that's wonderful. I, I can't fault that, yet I can ask you to do something with it. And that's not just teach. It is true that not everybody can get up and, and spout out what they know in such a way that other people learn. But I will tell you that if you're learning sacred principles, then you are called to do the works of those sacred principles. So as priests and priestesses, we are to help enlighten one another. When you look at the human body, it's amazing. I have a hand. The hand has fingers. And they can go out and grab things. I'm hungry. I take something and put it in my mouth. And my teeth will chew and I will eat it. And so you have all these different things that are working together for the greater good. But I see that illustration more along the lines of the various churches. When I say that, I don't just mean the Brighamites and the Josephites and the Campbellites and so on and so forth. The Cutlerites, I'm sorry. The Strangites. I also mean the Jews, the Catholics, Islam, the various Protestants that are out there, and all the other seeds of Abraham. I just named a bunch of the major ones, but there are so many more. There's more out there than, than I'm, I'm finding new ones all the time that people are introducing me to. Those can be the hands, the fingers, the mouths, and the teeth. But inside of us, we have white and red blood cells that serve their functions. We have bacteria in our guts that helps not only digest food, but do other things, to break things down. And all of these things work on a molecular level, on a microscopic level, to keep us alive, to keep us moving. We need to move beyond just the hand and the mouth. We need to get down to every single individual cell that is a seed of Abraham and love one another and recognize that we're all kings and queens, priests and priestesses. And be Israel. We can be Latter-day Saints and we can be Israel. We can be Christians and we can be Israel. We can be whatever nationality we belong to, and we can be Israel. We put Israel first, not, not the country of Israel, the concept of Israel. We put Israel first because God is first, not an organization. 
So my Thursday thought for you, after sharing all of this, this is 20 minutes of me talking here. After sharing all of this, my thought for you today is this. How can you be Israel? How can you be a priest or priestess, a king or a queen, and help move the work of the Lord forward? How can you serve other people? How can you help other people get closer to God? Think about that. That's my Thursday thought, and I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.